Yo, Agape Youth Ministries, what's up? This is yours truly positive and this Saturday night, 7 p.m. We are live on Zoom for Real Talk. And so we stay real. Yeah, bless. So, Positive, how have you been coping with this pandemic? Have you felt any pandemic fatigue at all? Um, sometimes, definitely. Um, it's probably been about two years now since we are locked down. Um, at first, I was elated because it was like a much deserved break like a, a little relaxation you didn't have to jump on a plane you had to deal with customs you had to be you just had time to yourself just to focus just to spend time with the family i mean we talk we play we laugh we do all kind of stuff when we're home but just everybody just in one space in one zone and that doesn't happen all the time you know so i was appreciative of that but over the course of time obviously you know you'd, you'd miss you know still impacting people because a big part of what I do or what you know people who do music do they you know they influence people and they impact people and I want to make sure that people could walk away with something so when you go at an event and, and I'm there and if I have a word I bring a little word inside the middle of the songs and so I was missing that aspect of it you know just being able to have that one-on-one -on -one rapper but then during the course of the pandemic you know, a lot of people started to get creative. So they started to have a lot of Zoom meetings. They started to have a lot of virtual stuff where, you know, but, you know, the comments have been lit up while you're there. And, you know, just a, this is a whole new experience. And I always welcome change because, you know, if this is the direction that you have to take in terms of ministry, then I just want to make sure that I'm always prepared and relevant for it, you know? Yeah, this pandemic has been hitting us all really hard in one yeah. way or the other. Um, yeah. So, what has been your favorite pastime throughout this season? Um, I don't want to say over the years. <laughs> it could be real with us tonight. It could be real. Remember, <laughs> it's real talk. Well, See, that's what I'm saying, right? It kind of maybe spend time with your significant other, you know. And, um, you know, among other things, Tennis, you know, we went to Tobago a lot, so yeah, um, that's that whole traveling. Because right now I'm living in Trinidad, so um, have been missing home for a long time. So when we go over, we vacation, we rent out the villas, and we go is the pool. We just I, I've just been, you know, just spending time with the the family. This is what anybody could really do during this time, right? You know, let's spend an excessive amount of time with your family and make sure that the time that you spend together is, is so much fun. We started to watch a lot of movies, um, so we have a lot of date nights in the room or any party or something just chilling watching something you know just 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 being home just enjoying home whatever it is whether it's cards we are big all first fans so me and my wife we have a rivalry going on right now <laughs> you know so yeah we just enjoying it man. <laughs> what is one of the most valuable lessons that you have learned so far throughout this pandemic um, um the enemy is always seeking to divide and I can see it in every stage of life, you know, from a little boy until now. I've seen where everything that, that we have to face as human beings, the enemy always tries to pervert it and make it something that divides us, something that causes us to have that one-on-one -on -one argument. If it's not how the prime minister does, it's about the elections. If it's not the elections, it's, it's how he treats the pandemic. If it's not the pandemic, it's about vaccination. And there's always just this dividing of the saints and this dividing of people on a whole. And I've learned more than ever during this time that God is looking for people who could see past, who could see past those, those, this, those simple things that try to divide us and looking for people who could be mature and could see the vision and put the vision above, you know, the, the, the circumstance and put the vision above the challenges, put the vision above the setbacks. And I've just learned that you know, we just have to keep our eyes focused on Christ during this time because if we keep, you know, giving air to all the, the chatter, chatter all around, then we will just kind of lose our way. And if it is that we want to, to really move forward and really impact people and really progress and really be the example that Christ has for us, then we have to just have a, a direct line. You know, I've looked around during this time and I've seen so many things like, I mean, over the years, you always seen it, but it's like, it just keeps shining a light right now where 
It's like I'm, I'm seeing people leaving churches because we passed the church to, to get vaccinated. I see people doing this because it's just like, it's just like, oh, bro, relax. <laughs> you know, let's let's take time. Let's just look at the meat of the matter. Look at what what God is really trying to say. You know, is it that He's pulling us closer and He wants us to to be a little bit more united, to be a little bit more of a, a one one song, one voice. You know, one army. When it is that people from you know, the outside looking in, you know, sometimes our lives as, as a divided church is not a blessing to them. And that is, has been affecting me. You know, I'm, I'm always trying to make sure that I'm wise enough that I could win souls because at the end of the day, that's, that's what we're here to do. We have to go out into the world and share the gospel and make sure that we could, you know, just make everybody come to know Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, you know, despite what, is set up to divide us. You know, Pastor, there's that's that's some really profound uh, statements that you just made there. And um, I don't think that many people are seeing what the end, some people are really blinded to what the enemy is doing in terms of using the COVID to divide us. And it's really good that, you know, you're one of those who, who've been able to see that and um, knowing that, hey, we can't afford to be distracted at this time, right? So this division, we need to, um, really pray about that, right? Notwithstanding some of the negative things that have come with COVID, it's good to know that even in a pandemic, you're still pressing on and progressing. Last year, 2020, um, in this very month, November, um, you had the virtual launch of your fourth album titled Heart Wired. So congratulations. You guys who didn't know that Positive had a fourth album launch in November 2020, well, now you know. And um, you all could congratulate him, right? Um, why did you choose the, ti the title Heartwired? And what is the title intended to convey? Well, you know, Heartwired is like a, it was derived from the word hardwired, which means the way that something is programmed, right? You know, so we have stuff that are programmed to function a certain way. And if it is that human beings, we are looking at the term heart-wired. It's really how the heart is programmed, really how the heart is connected to the Father, knowing that so that our choices, our decisions is, is really those that would please God, would please the Father, would give him satisfaction. I want to make sure that my heart is so connected to God that, you know, when he moves left, I want to move left. When he moves right, I want to move right to make sure that, you know, my ways line up with the Father's ways, you know, so... Being hardwired is, is being, you know, making decisions from a place of love, a place of, of God's love. You know, the Bible says that, you know, he sent his only son, which means that it was all of him. You understand? It wasn't just a piece of him. It was all of him, his only son. And that we could have life, you know, and, and that is what I wanted hardwired to really bring about so that people could actually choose to have a heart that is after God. You know, when... Um, when Samuel was in, you know, the house of Jesse and, you know, he looked upon the son and said, well, this must be the man, you know, and God had to say, hey, don't look at his stature, at his build, you know, because man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. And that was what I wanted to kind of bring about with the title and with the album. Positive, you do a lot of reggae style music. What inspired your passion for reggae as a local musician? Um, I guess maybe where I was born, um, the, the type of culture that we had in Tobago. You know, Trinidad is more of a soca nation, but Tobago is like like a reggae kind of nation. So every Sunday you'd hear the Gregory Isaac, Sunday Luciano's sweep over my soul. You know, <laughs> you know. So every Sunday you could just it's just like it was infiltrating and then to know that we got connected with um with papa san and to see how he could put the message of jesus christ in reggae music it was just so mind-blowing and and to hear stitchy when he come out of the scene and it was just like wow this thing and you know something about reggae is like i feel like it's one of those genres where it's universal it's like it could touch the soul of people whether it's white black indian chinese it's just like everybody just kind of gravitated to it and I remember back in the days so when you look at the influence of Bob Marley, he, there was a football match in Champions League. Sorry, this is soccer I'm talking about. So <laughs> uh, there was a football match in Champions League and there was a halftime performance, right? And 
they, they played One Love in the stadium. And this stadium had about 90,000 people. And every any camera keep panning around this stadium. Every single person was singing this One Love. And this is a European country, right? So it goes to show that there was something in reggae music that I believe that God could use to do great things. You know, and to see the places that I've been able to influence. Um, just recently, before the pandemic hit, I was supposed to be in a place called Vanuatu, which is on the coast of the Fiji Islands, between Fiji Islands and Australia. So so it's like, I'm like, these people, how could they even <laughs> get in contact? There's nothing that I could have done to promote myself in this country, you understand? But it just goes to show that people gravitate to a certain style of music. And once you have the right message in there, you could be as influential. And if it is that we have the message of Jesus Christ, which is the message, then reggae music, it is all the way. <laughs> so... Why do you why do you why did you choose to name yourself positive? What inspired your subriki? Oh, um, so I was dropping off the CD from my first song, a song called Trust in Jesus, and I left it at the station, the radio station, that was 98.1. And the person there was like, you know, who who is what's the name of the singer? And before I could even say my name, Joel Murray, that that word positive just shoot out of my mouth without thought, without question, without research, just shoot straight out of my spirit. And it was just like, you know, when I reflect on it, it's because that is the type of character that I always want to exemplify and represent. You know, that is the character of my family. It's the character that I was taught to always have a positive mindset, to always think positive, to always act positive, to always be positive. So that name has just permeated my entire life and, you know, caused a big transition in my life. Well, just piggybacking on what Isabella asked, um, the fact that you branded yourself positive, is, I, I find it almost ironic. I know you went into a little bit of why um, you've done that. Um, but um, for me, um, looking at, reading up on your life and seeing what you've been through, some of the most difficult, um, some really difficult challenges, including losing um, your loved one, your sister in 2003, and then right after, not sooner, but after in 2007, your mom. Um, so I, um, I'm still, I would like to know, I'm sure there are many, um, how, it, how was it possible um, for you to have experienced such tragic events and still maintain that positive outlook? Because um, it's one, time, one thing to be taught something, because you may have grown up, say, hearing, be positive. But then when these tragic events happen in your life, how, you know, how can you still remain positive um, to the point where you're almost like a poster child for positivity, for want of a better expression? Um, how exactly did you rise above um, those negativities that came against you to, be, to, to remain such a positive individual? Um, but, I mean, it definitely wasn't easy. You know, The year that my sister died, my mom was diagnosed with breast cancer. And she battled with cancer for four years before she died. And I always used to, you know, quarrel and say, you know, why does, why does the Lord take good people from the world and leaving all these wicked ones here? You know, people who, you know, they don't have a good bone in their body, as I like to call it. But they, they just here. And it's the truth is that, you know, God gives opportunity to people. And, you know, God sends us angels. And I believe that my mom was like an angel. And, you know, she graced my life for 19, 19 years. And I just, I'm grateful. I look back and I say, I'm grateful. Because when I look at the scripture verse in Romans chapter 8, verse 18, it says, the sufferings of the present, they are not worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed inside of us. And there is, God is waiting to show his glory. And if it is that we jump in his face, you see, his ways are higher than our ways and his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. So if it is we think that we know we know more than God or we know better than God, then we actually be fooling ourselves. But if it is that we can just be humble and go through the process, you know, there are scripture verses that, you know, that talk about comfort for all who mourn, which means that it is expected, as the word says, in this world you shall have tribulation. It didn't say you might have, it says you will. Bountum must happen. If it if it ain't happened already, it's coming your way. 
That's what the Bible says. We shall have tribulation. But the Bible also says to be of good cheer. You understand? Mm -hmm. And I always say, God, you know, if it has to be your will, your desire, then I am okay with it. You understand? As much as I love, I love my mom and I love my sister, I recognize that my love for them is not even greater than God's love for them. And he is the one that has always been in control of, of decision making. He knows when, he knows how, he knows where he's going to provide. I used to be quiet and say, but who's going to walk me down the aisle? And my mom is not going to be to walk after my children. And I'm saying, and I'm wallowing in tears. And I'm crying. But as a human being, you, you definitely feel hurt. So you definitely go through those emotions. But I just, I just felt a, a, a comfort and a peace. You know, when I look at scriptures, like, when your mother and your father forsake you, the Lord himself will take care of you. And just to, to it's, it's like, it's like my faith was like being strengthened because my mom died with $900 in her bank account, right? So I had just started university and my school books alone was like 1800 for that particular semester. And to know that your mom died and could not even leave, you know, a financial inheritance or something that you could actually start to build on, you know, it's just like, it's like God just literally sent people into my life to be a blessing to me along the way to make sure that all my needs were met. He made sure that I could graduate from my bachelor's degree. He made sure that I could come out, get married, to, to go through the process. And I've never had a day where I had to, to be begging for bread simply because God has always been the person in my corner. So I just continue to trust and believe that all things are going to be working for my good. It is well, it is well, it is well. At what point did you accept Jesus Christ into your, to your life? And um, is it that you were already walking with him or b before those crises happened? Okay, so uh, I grew up in a Christian home. So my, my dad was a pastor and my mom was a, a pastor's wife and later on became a pastor. So I always grew up here in the wood, hearing, you know, I, I have favorite sermons. I could probably just say 10 sermons in one right now, just simply because, you know, you're constantly hearing and you're constantly being exposed to the Bible and being exposed to the things of God. And, you know, it was only until maybe I was about nine or 10 and um, I was in church one day and Pastor Akindale, he, he preached a sermon. And he did not let the kids go to junior church that Sunday, right? And, um, and he said, one day, your parents will not be able to account for you. Hmm. And you would have to stand before the Lord and give him an account for yourself. And I don't know, boy, like, I don't know if it's like a fear or a... a, a a feeling just came over me and I was like, whoa, that means I I, I, I to, to really just accept the Lord as my Lord and Savior because I can't I can't let my mommy do it for me. I can't let my dad do it for me. I have to be the person to stand up. So it's like there was a sense of urgency at that time. And you know, when he had that altar call, I mean because I couldn't remember actually saying, you know, Lord Jesus, come into my heart, forgive me of my sin. I could not remember such a time. So hearing that word that Sunday morning, it just stood out to me. And I remember I was one of the first walking up that line because I said, I will not be left behind in this world. I want to make sure that when the Lord comes again, I am going to be <laughs> with him in glory land. So I just wanted to make sure that I could have made work out my salvation with fear and trembling on my own, you know, to make sure because the day is going to come when my parents will not have been able to give an account for me. And that is really how I stuck in there. And from since that time until now, I've just always tried to, to be pleasing. I may not always get it right, but, you know, I thank God that he is merciful, that he forgives, that he, you know, decides who he loves, he chastens. So sometimes you might be going through a situation and he's just, working on you making sure that you could be you know your best self making sure that you could overcome the next hurdle or overcome the next situation so that has been my story of how i actually received jesus christ as my lord and savior how mm. real did jesus prove himself to be to you in that 
difficult time when when that crisis hit with your sister dying and then your mom, you know, um, and how did that, um, your relationship with him, how did that make a difference in your life? Um, I would say <clears throat> um, when my mom, you know, it was um, a morning in October 2007 and I remember the morning very well. She had bacon shark for breakfast and... <laughs> You know, she had missed a chemotherapy appointment the day before. And she wasn't doing well at all. You know, she was missing a lot of time. She her hair fell out. Her pigmentation was very, you know, light, you know. So I could see that she was very weak. She wasn't able to stand on her own, walk by herself. You know, she was just going through it. And I saw her very last breath. Um, you know, my aunt was, everybody was just calling out to her name, you know, and some of these eyes are rolling in the back of their head. And all you're seeing is just that white. And, you know, we are started, we started saying, you know, her name is Yulda. And she's like, Yulda. You know, so my aunt, my her sister is saying, Yulda, Yulda. And she's answering, yes, Mulder, yes, Mulder. And then she stops answering. And Auntie Mulder keeps saying, Yulda, Yulda, Yulda. And then, there was like a stillness in the atmosphere and with with my mom seemingly already gone her is, she she still opened her mouth and she just said yes lord i'm here and at that moment it's like it made heaven become ever so more real in my life that moment gave clarity to a lot of questions that I might have had, you know, and it just had like a, a stillness in the room and the Holy Spirit was right there and there was just a stillness in the atmosphere. It's like, I can't even explain it properly in words, but it's like to be in the room, you had to feel, you know, your physical. It's like, you know, when they say, you know, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, sometimes it's like even your physical senses could tell that the presence of the Lord is there. And God being in that room, there's this song recently sung by um one of those guys from Maverick City. It's called Voice of God. And it says, at the birth of a newborn baby, I hear the voice of God. Even at the death of a loved one, I hear the voice of God. And that was that voice that I heard on that deathbed of my mom. So that was one of the realest moments for me in terms of my walk with God, you know, through those situations. When God doesn't answer our prayers in the way that we exactly want to, it really shakes up our faith, especially as young believers in Christ. So what is the best thing that we can do to that we can do when God doesn't allow things to go our way? Wait on the Lord. <laughs> <laughs> wait on the lord <laughs> wait on the lord the truth is um i recognize that sometimes you know we might be eager for something and if it is that god gave every single person what they wanted there'll be so so much chaos in the world we have two farmers living side by side one is praying for rain and one is praying for sunshine you know how does god respond to each prayer <laughs> and the answer is like he is, I, I'm so glad that I'm not God because there's a wisdom that is required, you know, for him to be able to, to answer prayers. I always say, if opportunities come when we are not prepared, then those opportunities that were meant to be a blessing ends up being a curse. So if it is that I have a son and my son is 10 years old and I'm so eager to bless him with a car, at 10 years old, that car now becomes a hazard to him. It's something that could take his life because he could sit in it. He doesn't know how to drive properly. He goes out into the street and he gets into an accident. But at 25 years old, when he has matured and when he has come into his own self, a car now could be a blessing to him because it was given at the right time. So I always say sometimes... You see, God is so perfect that we are the only people who have the, the problems to work out. You know, we have to iron out our own kinks. So if it is that we are in, in, the, in, in 
you know, in, in that place with God and we are saying, God, you know, I believe in you for this thing. There, there is that New Testament, it talks about that hall of faith where by faith, this one received this thing and by faith. And then it said that even those who did not receive the promise, they died still believing. <laughs> you understand? So it was like, sometimes you have to look and say, hey, I'm just going to be in a place of faith. And being in a place of faith, waiting is not an easy thing, but it helps to develop your character. It helps to develop you personally. It helps to push you in a place that you've never been before. So sometimes you've been so impatient, especially when you grew up in a household where everything was handed to you and you want, mommy, I'm hungry. So your mommy jumped everything and, you know, she cooked food and pizza on the table, you know, so you had everything. And sometimes that, that in itself, we need to take a, a step back and, put back and say, God, you know, if it is that it's not my time, I'm okay with it. I'm contented. I know that you are my gyra, so I will be content in this circumstance and I'll wait on you because he is determined. He says, he is he, every good and perfect gift comes from the Lord. So if it is that it ain't coming yet, that means we just have to wait on it. We have to wait. Make sure that we are not praying and asking amiss because those are one of the things too. Sometimes we pray. And we only receive because we ask amiss, and the Bible tells us that. So we have to understand how God works, what it is He wants us to have in this season, so that we not just pray. A lot of people just be praying for things. I see people just praying for millions of dollars, and they can't even tie a hundred dollars out of a thousand dollar salary. And it's just like, you know, God He gives us what we could manage. I've learned that at a very young age, and you know, so don't look for Him for for. For a car, when it is, you have a bicycle and it's dirty, you can't even pump it tire, you can't even clean it down, wash it down. You have to show that in little, you have to be faithful in little. And that is when much is going to apply. So while you wait, you have to be patiently waiting in faith and just continue trusting and believing God. Thanks for the advice. <laughs> so there, are, there are many youths today and people in general who are facing negative situations some of them even lost loved ones in this pandemic what are some practical tips you can share with us to help us remain positive and stay in faith in a negative situation um you see i like i point people to romans chapter eight that 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 chapter is like it has every possible thing that a human being needs in life. You know, it's like Romans chapter 8, it just tells us so much different things. It tells us that all things are working together for our good. And to those who are, to those who love God and are called according to purpose, and if it is that we, we believe what the word says, then we have to actually act and, you know, be obedient to what the word says. So that, that's how we demonstrate that we love God. He says, if you love me, you will keep my commands, right? So if it is that he's instructing us to have faith and he's instructing us to wait and he's instructing us to exercise comfort, to exercise patience, to exercise love, charity, grace, all these different things, we can't now, you know, just wallow away. If it is that we go the opposite direction, it's mean that we are contra contradicting what the word says and in so doing, we are actually showing that we don't love God. So I want to make sure that my choices, as it relates to how I, you know, deal with grief, how I deal with loss, how I deal with hurt, how I deal with pain, how I deal with anger, I want to make sure that my choices reflect, you know, the, the word of God, reflect the spirit of God, reflects, you know, God himself. Because if it is that, I am professing to be a believer in Jesus Christ. And somebody gave me a little drive on the road and I react and hold your mother son. So then it shows that that is what's inside of me. <laughs> you understand? But if it is that I could just have a little patience and hey, let me just slow down and let you go your way, you go your way. You know, people who are easy to resolve conflicts, who are just on the side of wanting to, to make things right. It's like this. It's just that is the heart that God really wants us to have. And, you know, in, in those times, it's like, I just have so much more appreciation for, for even loss right in this time. You know, I've seen so many people 
lose their lives during this last two years and to bury so much close friends. I remember when Jamie died, that was like a big mental hurdle. He was one of my best friends. And I'm, I'm just saying that, you know, this guy, honestly, at 46 years, he is like he did every single thing that he possibly could do. And it's like to making sure that that he died empty. There was, he just did so much, you understand? And it's just like making sure that is it's well that there is rest, you know, in, in the midst of loss and things that we just trust God that the people who will go before us are people who who would have done their part and and you know and serve the Lord wholeheartedly and we just find comfort in the fact that we will see them again one day. Looking at what God brought you through to where you are today, ministering to so many people across the Caribbean region, in hindsight, would it be correct to say that? Um, even the pain that you went through, that God took that pain and transformed it into purpose and ministry. Yeah. So that's a correct statement. Yes. So, okay. So that you're saying, um, you're, you're agreeing that God can bring purpose out of all pain, even when we don't that's understand right. it at the time that it's happening, that what he has done for you, he can do for us. Yes, those of us going through something painful right now, we don't understand it. Our faith might be wavering right now, but you're saying trust God that even our our pain, he he can he can he can take that purpose, that pain, turn it into purpose, and even bring ministry out of it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. All right. All right. So you will encourage people to do what? People in pain right now, you encourage them to do what? I will encourage them. To go before God and pour their hearts before God, you know. The Holy Spirit, the, the Bible calls him a comforter, and he is the one who can actually, you know, lift up. There's a scripture in Job, I think it is, that says, Um, when let them that feel cast down say there is a lifting, right? Um I think it's Job 22. I could be wrong. Job, but you know, I know it's in Job. So let them that, that feel cast down, let them that, that are cast down feel, say that there is a lifting. So I feel like when we get into a place with God and there is a real relationship, real understanding, that we just give ourselves unto the Holy Spirit and let him be the lifter of our heads. It's not always easy because everybody experiences grief differently, right? And grief is a natural response to loss. You know, it's, it's, it's natural. It is, you know, people who lose things, they, they go through this thing and it's a natural response to loss. But there is a place that God is saying that he is in a position to comfort all who mourn. And that is what I want to tell people, that you have a situation and it might be weighing you down. Don't just take it as, as uh, that is just the Christian thing to say, but if it is that you really put it in God's hands, you know, it says, come unto me, all ye that are heavy laden. He's the one that is giving us rest. And many times, a little bit of rest is what helps us to see a bit clearer. You know, sometimes he's just saying, because he himself, when he rested on the seventh day, he made all these things and he's saying that if it is that i could you know show you comfort and show you that that embracing then what will happen is that it will put your mind at ease and you will have a clearer vision or a clearer pathway of what is your next step many times people in grief their next steps are clouded by their emotions mm -hmm. so if it is that they continue just making rash decisions you know, because they are hurting, because they are hurting, then it changes the course of their life. And if it is that we want to always be on the path of the just, as the Bible calls it, then we have to really let, you know, that that Holy Spirit comfort us. You take that thing to God, you get in God's face, you quarrel, cry, do whatever you have to do, get it out and make sure that you could find that place of rest to be able to move forward. You know, one of the things I like about you since you came on positive is that when we ask you questions, you have a ready scripture to pull. I don't know if you all observed that about positive, but positive know his word, 
right? And that is one of you, the ways we win our battles. We have to know the word, not only know the word, but believe the word because that's what he has, you know? He has challenges as well, but he believes the word because you can have the word and not believe it as well. So I'm getting that you really believe what the word says and um, you hold on to the word of God. You know, that is what is taking you through. So I hope everyone on tonight is encouraged to do the same thing. Um, as a youth growing up, even when you were going through those difficult moments, um, did you ever think that God would use your life in such a tremendous way one day to impact so many people around the world like he's doing right now? Did you ever think God will do that? When I was younger, I, I always liked music, right? So I would go into a little closet that we had in, in the house in Tobago and and I would be closing my eyes and I'm imagining tens of thousands of people and I'm saying, you know, <laughs> and this already gets sweeter. And I'm there and it's like I'm in our own right, my own world in that little place. And it's just like, you know, I always think that it was possible, but sometimes even though something is possible, you never think that it will happen, you know. They're, and I find there's a lot of that things with believers. It's like, we know that God could do miracles and we know that so many things are possible, but sometimes we believe that it, the, it wouldn't happen for us. <laughs> you know that? So it's like, we know that he's a mighty healer, but we, we, don't, we don't think that he, could, that he will remove this diabetes. He, you know, he's a, a, a provider. He's a Jehovah Jireh, but we don't think that he will provide this house or provide this land or provide this car that we need. So I have recognized that that if it is, I want to I want to experience, you know, the dreams that you might have or whatever, then we have to make it a reality. I have learned that he is there helping us along the way, but he didn't give me this passion to let it die. You understand? He gave me this passion because if it is that I could harness my gift, harness my ability, do something, something grand, keep working on it, practicing. When I wake up again in my kind of doing, I just chanting and going in the school halls, I'm making all the noise in the school because there is something trying to come outside. You know, there's something inside of me that wants to get out. And it, and if it is that we're not careful and we just keep bottling it up and waiting for God, you know, sometimes you give a word that he sees you ministering in China. You're just going to sit down there and say, all right, when is China coming? <laughs> and China never comes. You know, man? But we have to put in the work and, you know, get in there and, you know, sacrifice the time and spend the last money. Sometimes I was eating crits and cheese because the little income I was getting, sometimes I wanted to put everything in music. It's just, it's just understanding that whole mindset. I had this car. It was a, um, a blue Mazda 3 to 3 And, I had met this producer. His name was Super Dupes. He had produced for John Legend and Mary J. Blige and all these, all these big singers in the States or whatever. And I had this song. It was called Let Me Be The One that's a song with a friend of mine called Nicky Rimple. And I'm saying, this guy needs to produce this song. I don't know what, what it would take, but I was Googling for months until I found that email address that might be his. And then I sent the email, sent him the demo of the track. I say, I know you don't work with independent artists or with small artists or with even gospel artists, but I have just heard your influence on this song. And I believe that you are the person that are required to get this song to where it needs to go. So I would ask you to just, you know, believe God with me that we could do something great together. This man say, you know, I don't work with small artists, you know, but, but because there is something about you and something about this song, I'm going to let it work. And then he gave me a fee. I didn't have the money. I went and sell the car. I say I, I go foot it out because I want to make sure I can get this song done. And that is the kind of mindset about purpose-driven people. It's like they always want to make sure that the vision comes first. You understand? That the vision is accomplished no matter what, no matter what way. Because at the end of the day, you, you drive down the road, you putting all your eggs in this car and by tomorrow you're going on the road, somebody bunks you in the car right off and that was the end of that year. We, we had to know where the treasure is because the Bible says where your treasure is, you understand? Where your heart is, that is where your treasure is also. So I had my heart, put my heart and soul in music and I believe God from 
12 years old until now that he was going to transform me and do something great with the ministry. What do you believe, just piggybacking on the question I asked before, what do you believe is the mission, the specific mission that God has given to you? Oh, my, my mission, okay. Um, I wrote it down a couple of years ago. It was like to positively impact the nations of the world by sharing the heart of God through my music, through my character, and through my lifestyle because i recognize that sometimes without singing just somebody being in in my presence or you know me being somebody else's presence that they are looking at at me looking at how i treat my wife looking at how i move with my children and these little things are a blessing to them you understand and it's like it's just yeah thanks <laughs> And these are the things that are a blessing to them. And it's like, I recognize that music is not everything. You understand? Music is just a, a ministry. But there is, there is, there is so much other things that beside music. People looking at your integrity. They're looking at, if you say you're going to come on a program, you're going to come on. Even though I was late tonight, I'm sorry. I came from Pipe Princess Town. Yeah. And <laughs> I came to a wedding. And <laughs> I was supposed to be on at 4 today. And I don't know. The guy just wanted me to stay around for a little bit longer. So, sorry I'm late, everybody. Again, I apologize. Yeah, but it's just like um, <laughs> it's just about making making sure that God has come first in everything, Jack. And I don't know how to explain it. I hope I hope that's uh, the, the, your question, Justice. So, as a young person, I don't yet know what my passion is. So, I was wondering how can I figure out what God wants me to do in with my life and the purpose He has for me. I have to spend time. There's no shortcuts to intimacy. If it is, I want to know what my wife thinks about me. I have to spend time with her to know, you know. And just like us, you know, if he's the manufacturer of us, then we have to spend time with the manufacturer to know what the purpose of the product is, you know. So we have to get in his face, continue saying, Lord, you just show me, show me, show me. You know, I want to be able to make sure that I live my life, you know, 100% for you. And I want to make sure that I'm living effectively working in my purpose every single day and a lot of people sometimes they go to the grave and they didn't live a, a day in their purpose and i don't want that to be me or anybody else here tonight i just want to make sure that we could all just you know get in god's face and say lord you know this is my uh, having this desire you know show me is this for me you know what it is that you'll have me to do what it is that you'll have me to say you know we try to include god in everything and not sometimes you get so comfortable. We know that when we go on the road, we could get our red band maxi to go down to town, you know. So we don't we don't say, Lord, cover this thing. One time I went in a plane, and before the plane even took off, I fell asleep. So I didn't even catch the name of the pilot, which means that I have so much faith that this pilot gonna take me from point A to point B. And I don't have enough faith in God like I have in a pilot. No, that's wrong. So I had to constantly have a relationship with God. To always, you know, let him show me, hey, this is, you know, I'm feeling this thing in my spirit. I feel this and that's why people do some crazy things. And you want to say, them and you ain't from God. But if they have this passion that's so great on the inside that even though it, it seems unorthodox, it's like, that's what, and they would have to answer for that. You understand? So I just always say, you want to know your purpose. You spend more time with God and just continue praying and just, be, you know, living by faith. You know, sometimes you might not hear the entire thing because there's um there's this other scripture oh cool uh, i really like to talk about scriptures i'm <laughs> i don't know if I'm, that's a problem right <laughs> that many times we see through a glass darkly right that bible tells us right that we see through a glass darkly which means that there's somebody who sees the whole the whole vision the whole thing so if it is that we only see through a glass darkly which means that all we might see is the next step even though you don't know the full thing now trust god with the next step you understand? And then one step will lead to another step. And before you before you know it, you're halfway up the staircase. If there was one thing you could change about your past, what would it be? One thing about my past? Yeah. That you would change. Hard question, boy. <laughs> um, um, that's a hard one. That's a real tough question. <laughs> um, if one thing I could change, I would honestly... I would have not preferred to experience loss in the way that I did. You know, um, like just just even in these times, I see people, fellas with their, with their mom and their, 
and every time they give out a speech, I want to say my mom, you know, <laughs> it's like, you know, I just, I, I, I miss that part of growing up to, to have that experience, to have my kids know who their grandmother was or is, you know, if it's that could have changed, you know, my predicament, my story, then I would have changed loss that I had to experience. You know, I'm still grateful to God for whatever choices that he makes and whatever, but I personally, if it is, I could have changed something and if I had the power to change it, I would have. Yeah. So in, in researching for this interview, I found that you not only sing, but write and produce your songs. Have right. you written all of your songs and where do you get the inspiration to come up with consistently good quality content? I wrote almost all songs. Um, on my last album, I didn't write two of the songs by myself. Um, we actually, I met with one of my, a good friend of mine, his name is Marvin Thomas, and together we did um, You Are Everything and a song called More Than Good. And for those two songs, um, that was really his inspiration that come and I just put the finishing touches on it. But for, for, for music, I don't know if it's for other people, but it's like for me, I just, I'm just always hearing, hearing it, you know, like always hearing it. And it's like my duty as the ambassador for hearing the music is to make sure that I could produce it and write it in a way that I heard it. So it's like when I was in Brazil one time, I, I just keep hearing, and this already gets sweeter. And it will come and it will go. So when I, when I get a piece, I record it and I put it down. And then I, I get an excuse because it's more than just music. And then I just record that piece and I put it down. And I was like, all right, I, I hear this. And sometimes you might be struggling to hear it, huh? but if sometimes you're coming in pieces and it comes good enough, then you will just get it. And it's that one, sometimes you stand up in front of me. And by the time you open your mouth, everything just coming out. <laughs> that, is the be- that is the best one to me, right? But, um, you know, generally, everything is like an a influence. Everything is like an experience, you know. Losses are, I experience, you know. Hurt is an experience. Love is an experience. Marriage is an experience. Fatherhood, challenges in society, you know, the government. Just different. So, as you could write about so many different things because there is a topic for every season, you know? So, apart from music, do you have any other passions? I like swimming. I like fishing. <laughs> and I like soccer. I am a full blown Real Madrid fan. Like we went up to the stadium in Spain, everything to me. So <laughs> you could stand up there with it. Um, that thing on your neck, that scarf on your neck, <laughs> singing the La Liga anthem. <laughs> so yeah, I like I like all this stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Out of all these songs you've sung, do you have any favorite song? Uh, I like. <laughs> I like Never Let Go and Two Man Army. So that's the two favorite there. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. And speaking of favorite song, my favorite song, well, number one is Never Let Go, which you just said. Two Man right. Army and also Mighty Healer. Um, I'd like to know what was your inspiration for Mighty Healer, especially, um, you know, with stuff that you would have gone through, losing your, par- your mom and sister, but yet still believing in God to be a healer. Um, and do you have any testimonies coming out of that particular song, Mighty Healer? Yeah, um, Mighty Healer. I just wanted to kind of, again, this is one of these songs that you just keep hearing in your spirit. So it's like, I want to make sure that I could just articulate what I've been hearing. And um, I wanted people to know that even though, even though they might have suffered illness or somebody might have died with illness, it doesn't change the fact that God is a healer. See, everybody have this connotation that if it is that he didn't heal, it means that he can't. It is not true. You know, if it is he didn't heal, it was a choice. And we have to understand that, that he is the greatest physician, you know. And I wanted to let that be audibly clear in that particular song. Um, and I remember through that song, my aunt, my mom's sister, she was also diagnosed with cancer. And... You know, she was just, you know, at at first she was a bit broken and then she started to just get in tune with the Holy Spirit and God 
let her, said, move from this apartment. And she moved into a different apartment, a two-bedroom apartment. And the Holy Spirit said, I want to get one of those rooms that is solely for prayer. And she cleared out everything from the second room and she built an altar there, right? And then it turns out that the landlady actually had a garden of all types of different herbs and stuff. And then the Holy Spirit said, I want you to walk out in the garden and get some turmeric and get some kale and get some this. And you're going to blend this this morning. And then the next morning, you're going to blend this. And every morning she received that instruction. And after living from instruction of the Holy Spirit for about two or three years, then, no, this is not doctors. And this is just a, that still small voice, right? She, she said, and she said, and Joel, you wouldn't believe that I've been having that mighty healer just playing in the background, just setting the atmosphere because I just want to just believe God. And then she went back to the hospital and they did that scan on her and she was cancer free. So I just know for a fact that hmm, even though my mom passed some cancer, it doesn't change the fact that God could heal cancer, you know? So God is a healer all in all counts of life. So positive, I'd like to know what are some practical things that you can do to stay grounded and to build your relationship with Jesus Christ that you'd like to share with us? Um, I'd point everybody to Joshua 1.8. It says, this book of the law, let it always be on your lips. You understand? Meditate on it day and night that you may be careful in observing to do all that is written therein. And then you shall make your way prosperous and shall have good success. Which means that God is equating success and equating all these things to simply obedience in the word. You understand? So we just have to continue to get into the word, understand what it says, spend time. You know, we have the scripture, we get in it, fast preach the word, let do just die on a Monday morning, but Tuesday, we still pick it back up. Wednesday, we go into it again. And we just get in, into the world. You see, once you have the world with you, then current will go. Your battery could die. You don't have to look for it on the internet. You have it inside here. <laughs> you have to put it in here, and then everything will be right. What are you looking forward to doing when the COVID-19 pandemic is over? I'm winding on. I want to go to Bora Bora. <laughs> <laughs> I want to go in one of those hotels <laughs> where it's like, that's in the Fiji Islands. I want to go in the underground hotel where the sharks are swimming outside of the hotel room and you're looking around and you're seeing all the corals. I want to, I want to see that. I want to go to <laughs> Egypt. I want to see the pyramids. I want to go to um, Japan. I want to walk in. I want to go and learn that Tai Chi. I want to do, I want to, I want to live. I just want to experience what this world has to offer me because no man knows the hour when we all take our last breath. So I want to make sure that I just do as much as possible. And obviously, I still want to be able to touch hearts and minister to people around the world. What more can um, we expect from positive going forward? Definitely more music, more albums. You know, I'm trying to develop different ministries um, in terms of sharing the word and, you know, just being able to have programs or so that would allow people to experience, you know, move their potential into kinetic. And, you know, because I recognize that a lot of people have the idea and the, and the passion and the desire, but they don't have the, the knowledge, you know, and they lack that, that extra oomph that is required to push them a little bit forward and a little bit further. So I want to make sure that I could have little, little small programs that are geared to just helping people experience their own giftings. You know, they could... You know, show them like this is what this is what I did, or it might not work for everybody, but at least you know I could try to help you to move forward in what you want to do with with your gift and your ministry. Wait, 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 uh -huh. wait! I see a yeah. comment. Somebody say, "I want to go bora bora, but I pora pora." You see, <laughs> and you see when you start to declare and confess negative things into your life and think if it isn't a careful. You know, sometimes you might be joking and nobody if it is I say, but I pour up pour. I say I will never say that in my life in Jesus' name. Listen, it don't take money to take your places, you know. It just takes passion, desire, and faith. I put in all my faith. I say, Lord, if somebody had to meet me on the road and say, Hey, 
you know, I show you so much favor here. I just want to be able to be a blessing to you. What would you like me to do? I say I want a, two tickets to go to Bora Bora. <laughs> you understand? So if it is, if it is, I keep saying, I Bora Bora. Uh-uh. I ain't trying to see Bora Bora like that at all. So I ain't know who tied that day, but I just like yeah, I ain't doing that. <laughs> so y'all hear that, right? No negative declarations over your life. Only the word of Death God. And life and the power of the tongue. Exactly. How do you handle old-fashioned Christians who may not be in favor of you, of your of the genre of your music and the fact that you support Lux? And the fact that you support Lux. As Lux. in dread like yeah. yes. <laughs> okay. Um I don't know. I don't know if I that I support Lux. I just have a hairstyle for now. You know, stands on here, go to the bar and cut this thing off. <laughs> it's just like, it's neither here nor there. Me, it's just a personal liking, you know, in, in a season. I don't think I'd have hair for the rest of my life. But um, I think that what helps people to, to overcome, let me say, old fashioned believers or however you might call it, is consistency. If it is that, you know, you are consistently really serving the Lord wholeheartedly and you know, really showing and there is fruit that is coming from this ministry and fruit that is coming from the things that you do and say, then people will start to change their own old time beliefs to accommodate you simply because you have been a blessing to them or you have you are they you possess something that they see that they want to stand by. You understand? I've I've been to Jamaica where um in Jamaican culture dreadlocks is like a serious thing. So being invited to sing there with dreads in my hair. You know, and when I was finished, some la old ladies in the audience were like, at first I was a bit skeptical to listen to your song then, boy, but you really are the spirit I got inside of you. I, you know, just with those little things, just a kind of consistency over the years. I don't think my mother-in-law even <laughs> went to hear me now suck it because she had. I don't know how she probably felt about dreadlock. Yeah, like dreadlocks, or yeah, you're okay with it. You're okay? She's okay with it now. <laughs> see? see, see, sometimes you just, when you grow up learning and understanding something, you know, you feel like that is the Bible. But sometimes we confuse tradition with scripture. And if it is that we have to, to really think about what God is looking for, He ain't looking to see where you have in your head, He ain't looking to see what you have inside of your heart. You understand? So. I know we said we were just safe too, but there was one that I saw with somebody asking, when you take, when you're waiting on God and waiting on God seems so long, you know, like you're waiting and you're waiting and you're waiting and just seem like the waiting period is not ending. What do you do? You wait some more. <laughs> <laughs> you wait some more. You wait some more. I just, I, I was just, don't be in too much of a haste that you want to go before, that you want to go in front of God, because that is a dangerous place to be. So if it is that it's not happening now, then you have to wait. You understand? You try to occupy your time. While you're waiting, pick up a hobby. <laughs> you know? You're waiting on this breakthrough here, but you could experience something over here. And who knows? Maybe that thing that you're waiting on is what not supposed to be for you, and that thing that you're picking up as a new hobby is what you're really supposed to be getting into. So while you're waiting, you know, Get yourself busy. You know, you're, you're single. You go and you get thing. You, you, you do what you have to do while right? you're waiting on your breakthrough house. Some people waiting on house. They put husband on the back burner. They put marriage on the back burner. They're waiting on a house. They want to have everything settled before they move forward. And, you know, they might even be thinking that, you know, this thing not happening. And sometimes it's not happening because we don't know how to wait. We don't know what to do while we're waiting. But sometimes you have to shift your focus and believe that God could use different angles, different directions. Not because he gave me reggae music means that he will give um, give another artist the same platform, the same thing. You know, some people might have a, a social media influence. Some people might have an influence with an older audience. Some people might have it with young people. So if it is, I just trying to look and say, yeah, this, I want to have what that person have. And that is not how life works. You know, life works that each man has his own blessing there is nothing that somebody else have that belongs to me you understand god has created something special for me and me only you understand and i just want to wait for it because if it is i run in front of god i could get knocked down
my poem is entitled Two Man Army. Mountain mover, move this mountain. Here I am struggling. I can't see my way. Here with these problems, tall like a mountain. Being alone in this world is so cool. My so-called friends, my secret haters, even the haters that I can see. These people that are wishing that I fall and wishing that it all comes tumbling down. You won't believe the things I see, the crazy things. In spite of it all, I will rise. Because if God is for me, then who can really be against me? I know that I can still rise as long as I put my faith in Christ. You know what I need to do? I need to roll in my two-man army, my Jesus and I. I know once God goes before me, they can't stop this ride. They might not. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Good night. I really enjoyed um, what was shared tonight. Thank you for sharing. Um, okay. <laughs> I never let go. I never let go. Child will never let me down. He's a driver of my vehicle. I never let go. Because I jog give me the strength to stand up. Child will never let me down. He's a father for the people. Come, come along, let's labor in the vineyard. Come, let us cultivate the fruits of our hearts. So, oh, yeah, na na na. Because no man can see clearly without you. He is my God and my protector. That's why my love him more than words can express. I him will pick me up from all the mess. I never let go. I never let go. Child will never let me down. He's a driver my vehicle. I never let go. Because a child gave me the strength to stand up. Child will never let me down. He's a father for that is why I'm rolling in my two man army, my Jesus and I. I know once God goes before me, they can't stop this right now. I'm rolling in my two man army, my Jesus and I. I know once God goes before me, they can't stop this right. Strap up my Gideon boots. Now we are ready for the war. Satan will take me for fool. But me and Jesus are tall. Half a defender's truth stands spiritually strong. So we're not dilute. We got to live pure. I want to make my elections sure. Yeah. I'm rolling in my two man army. My Jesus and I. I know once God goes before me. They can't stop this right no. I'm rolling in my two man army. My Jesus and I. I know once God goes before me. Sing not pretty. Remember them chop off the head of John the Baptist in the city. Oh. And what they did to Stephen without reason. Was it because his words were seasoned? We've got to live right. It may cost us a lot, but in the end it will be worthwhile. I don't care if them hate me, how them rate me. All of me will give God glory. Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. Just a two of us. Only need my two men army. Jesus and I. And no one's got those before me. They can't stop this try, boy. Only need my two men army. My Jesus, you know, yeah, I know one's got clothes before me. 
Chop on this kitty and boots, yeah. I know we're ready for the war. See it on him, what take we be fool. But me and Jesus so far. I be defend his truth. He stands spiritually strong, so me can't die loose. I see we got to stay pure. Just make my election sure. Sing it out again, yeah. Rolling in my tomb and army. See my Jesus in life. I know what's got goes before we. They can't stop this right, boy. Rolling in my tomb and army. You see, I know one's got goes before we are. This gospel thing not pretty. Remember them chop up the leg of John the Baptist in the city. And what they did to Stephen without a reason. Was it because his words were seasoned? We got to live right. Will it be conscious a lot? But in the end, it will be worthwhile. I don't care if they this world can't break me. My life will give God glory. You say, just in and Vanessa, my Jesus in life. You see, I know one's got those before me. One family, I know we say, rolling in my. You're not far and far. <laughs> Yeah. You see, I know one scout goes, yeah, yeah. We're living in a physically, spiritually, mentally, practically, no. Weapons of a warfare are not fun, but we got my taste of happy. Give a little taste, a little love the gospel. No, no, that's I won't talk of it, yeah. I want a full cast meal, okay? Genesis Revelation. That's how you know your role. Rolling in my two men are me. I know I said those before me. I know me alone, I say. Two men are me. Once God walks before I can die. Yeah, whoa, yo, yo, yo. I ain't seen all the more moving it on. Everybody say, whoa, yo, yo, yo. I said, whoa, yo, whoa, 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 whoa. I'm rolling in my tomb and army. My Jesus and I, 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 I. Almighty God, we serve a mighty God. So no our God is mighty. Only my heal sickness in my body. So we serve a mighty God. Hey, do you want a physician? He will give you a prescription. She don't tell you the dosage. Be like a mustard seed mixing phrases. Just believe the master, not dealing a counterfeit disaster. Run away from the old man, we say Jesus is it. Hey, I'm Mr. We serve a mighty God. Mighty, 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 mighty. So we serve a mighty God, I say. Mighty, 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 mighty. mighty, 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 mighty. So no God is mighty. And in my heel, sickness in my body. So we serve a mighty God. Mighty, mighty, mighty. I'm Mr. Mighty. Semi-day, I'm a semi-day, I'm a semi-day, I'm a semi-day, I'm I'm a semi I'm a semi I'm a this must follow the man dimension of his holy name, the brother Jesus intervention, boy. I'm Mr. We serve a mighty God. Mighty, 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 mighty. We serve a mighty God, I say. Mighty, 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 mighty. Say no one God is mighty. Only my ill sickness in my body. We serve a mighty God, I say. Mighty, 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 mighty. I'm Mr. Mighty. 